Good morning. Welcome to Good Shepherd Episcopal Church. For those of you here in our worship space this morning, and for all of those who are joining us via our live stream, uh, today it is good to be back together. This is our second week uh, back together here for in-person worship. So we're going to start each week with just some friendly reminders. Um, first of all, please keep your mask on at all times. You will receive instructions later in the service about coming forward for communion. Um, only myself and the reader will take our masks off when we are publicly speaking here inside the chancel uh, area, not out in the church. Please watch your distance. We've carefully uh, mapped out the seating so that we can maintain uh, proper social distancing. We, we are still not allowed to sing, so um, if, if it's your favorite hymn, I'm sorry. Um, just hum along and sing in your heart this morning. Um, we will not be passing the peace, as you might expect, and I'll give some additional instructions, as I said, uh, regarding communion and um, how we will end the service and exit the building together. So welcome again. It is good to be here in person. I said to the folks last week, it feels like Easter, um, being back together and uh, having a sense of connection and community with one another. So let's observe just a few moments of silence, and then when you hear the organ begin, you're invited to stand for the opening procession. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and blessed be his kingdom now and forever. Amen. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, you are always more ready to hear than we to pray. 
and to give more than we either desire or deserve. Pour upon us the abundance of your mercy, forgiving us those things of which our conscience is afraid, and giving us those good things for which we are not worthy to ask, except through the merits and mediation of Jesus Christ, our Savior, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. A reading from the prophet Isaiah. Let me sing for my beloved my love song concerning his vineyard. My beloved had a vineyard on a very fertile hill. He dug it and cleared it of stones and planted it with choice vines. He built a watchtower in the midst of it and hewed out a wine vat in it. He expected it to yield grapes, but it yielded wild grapes. And now inhabitants of Jerusalem and people of Judah judge between me and my vineyard. What more was there to do for my vineyard that I have not done in it? When I expected it to yield grapes, why did it yield wild grapes? And now I will tell you what I will do to my vineyard. I will remove its hedge and it shall be devoured. I will break down its wall and it shall be trampled down. I will make it a waste. It shall not be pruned or hoed, and it shall be overgrown with briars and thorns. I will also command the clouds that they rain, no rain upon it. For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel, and the people of Judah are his pleasant planting. He expected justice, but saw bloodshed, Righteousness, but heard a cry. The word of the Lord. The psalm appointed for this morning is Psalm 80. Please join me in reading the selected verses 7 through 14 in unison. Restore us, O God of hosts. Show the light of your countenance and we shall be saved. You have brought a vine out of Egypt. You cast out the nations and planted it. You prepared the ground for it. It took root and filled the land. The mountains were covered by its shadow and the towering cedar trees by its boughs. You stretched out its tendrils to the sea and its branches to the river. Why have you broken down its wall, so that all who pass by pluck off its grapes? The wild boar of the forest has ravaged it, and the beasts of the field have grazed upon it. Turn now, O God of hosts, look down from heaven, behold and tend this vine, preserve what your right hand has planted. The second reading is from Paul's letter to the Philippians. If anyone else has reason to be confident in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day, a member of the people of Israel of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew born of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, and as to righteousness under the law, blameless. Yet whatever gains I had, these I have come to regard as lost because of Christ. More than that, I regard everything as lost because of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things, and I regard them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but one that comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God based on faith. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the sharing of his sufferings by becoming like him in his death, 
if somehow I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already obtained this or have already reached the goal, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Beloved, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but this one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the heavenly call of God in Christ Jesus. The word of the Lord. Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Matthew. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Jesus said, listen to another parable. There was a landowner who planted a vineyard, put a fence around it, dug a wine press in it, and built a watchtower. When the harvest time had come, he sent his slaves to the tenants to collect his produce. But the tenants seized his slaves and beat one, killed another, and stoned another. Again, he sent other slaves more than the first, and they treated them in the same way. Finally, he sent his son to them, saying, They will respect my son. But when the tenants saw the son, they said to themselves, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him and get his inheritance. So they seized him threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. Now when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those tenants? They said to him, he will put those wretches to a miserable death and lease the vineyard to other tenants who will give him the produce at the harvest time. Jesus said to them, have you never read in the scriptures that the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone? This was the Lord's doing and it is amazing in our eyes. Therefore, I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people that produces the fruits of the kingdom. The one who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces, and it will crush anyone on whom it falls. When the chief priests and the Pharisees heard this parable, they realized that he was speaking about them. They wanted to arrest him, but they feared the crowds because they regarded him as a prophet. The Gospel of the Lord. of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. Eric, could I ask that my mic come down just a bit in the house? Thanks. Well, I can't see your faces, but I can see your smiles underneath your mask this morning, which is great. It's good to be together. As a young boy, I remember going on car rides with my grandfather. These were usually short trips to the local market to pick up a gallon of milk or the daily paper. But the trips were always just long enough for my grandfather to tell a story. And every story ended with a grandfatherly nugget of wisdom. He would say things like, remember to always thank the Lord for your health, Doug. Or put family first because it's the only family you've got. Or do well in school because you're going to need a good job to earn a living. Sounds like a grandfather, right? But it was that last statement that I always found perplexing, because it confused me that 
life somehow had to be earned. As a child, it was strange to think that living was something that had to be earned or worked for because, of course, like most children, I was carefree and not so much concerned with the more complicated matters of life. Of course, as I grew older, I came to understand precisely what my grandfather was trying to teach me. That the world in which we live is a world in which anything of value, anything worth holding on to, anything, anything worth believing in is something that we somehow have to earn. Our world, if you think about it, is based on a competition model in which there are winners and losers. There are those who succeed and those who fail, those who earn a good living and those who don't. And this competition model is deeply ingrained in our American psyche. We believe fundamentally that somehow the good life is something that must be earned. Now, on the other end of the spectrum is what I would call the participation trophy model, right? The sense that everyone on the team, regardless of your attendance or your ability or your contribution, receives the same reward. And you know that there are folks who are passionately opposed to the participation trophy model, arguing that it doesn't teach our kids what it means to earn something, right? What it means to earn anything of value and worth and what is worth holding on to in life. Now, when it comes to our spiritual lives, I think that most people tend to view their relationship with God according to one of these two models. There are those for whom their relationship with God is something that they have to earn, something that is based on becoming a certain kind of person, achieving a certain level of holiness or spirituality or religiosity. Let's call that the competition model. And then there are those for whom God is sort of the great benefactor in the sky who freely bestows goodwill and good feelings, and it doesn't so much matter what you do or how you live. Let's call that the participation trophy model. What I'm here to tell you this morning is that neither of those models are what we find in the New Testament. What we find in early Christian communities is a radically different way of viewing the world and subsequently viewing our relationship with God. What we find in the New Testament is a model that we can call grace. Grace. And if you've been with us the last few weeks, you know that we have been learning about how grace is a radically different way of seeing the world, seeing ourselves, and seeing our relationship with God. Grace is unfair. Grace is unexpected. And this morning we discover that grace is fundamentally unearned. Which brings us to Paul's letter to the Philippians this morning, one of my favorite letters in the New Testament, because it gives us a glimpse into Paul's own spiritual journey. And Paul begins by laying out his spiritual heritage and accomplishments. He says that he is, a, he is an Israelite circumcised on the eighth day. He is a Hebrew of Hebrews. He is, he is of the tribe of Benjamin, a small but powerful and faithful tribe. He is a Pharisee, a member of the religious establishment. When it comes to adherence to the law, he is blameless. Check, 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 check. Paul is laying out the fact that according to the, the world's model of competition, he's been successful. He has earned his place in the world. He has earned respect and recognition. He has earned a sense of power and privilege in his life. But then in the very next breath, he says, but none of that matters anymore. Somewhere along the line, Paul came to the place where he realized that everything that he had earned, that everything that he accomplished were not the things that ultimately brought meaning and purpose in his life. And he came to the conclusion that it was about this new relationship with Jesus that turned everything upside down in his world. Paul came to the conclusion that somehow knowing Jesus intimately and passionately was what gave meaning and purpose and identity in his life. 
And so what Paul ultimately discovered is that the competition model is empty and hollow because we can't earn life, at least not the abundant life of the kingdom of God. That kind of life is only possible by grace. That kind of life is only possible because of God's blessing and favor and provision in our lives that is unfair, unexpected, and fundamentally unearned. But I want you to notice that for Paul, this experience of grace was not just a spiritual handout. This in no way was simply a spiritual participation trophy. Grace changed his life. Grace changed the trajectory of his mission. Grace gave him purpose. Grace gave him meaning. Grace gave him a sense of identity as a beloved child of God. Of course, Paul is quick to say, I'm not there yet. I haven't fully arrived. I still have a long way to go, and I think all of us can identify with Paul in that regard. But Paul says, this one thing I do, I'm forgetting what lies behind. And I'm pressing on towards the goal, the prize of the heavenly calling of God. I'm pressing on, forgetting what lies behind. Forgetting the old model of competition. Forgetting all of my mistakes. Forgetting all of my regrets. Forgetting everything that has held me back. And pressing on to the prize, to the goal, to the vision that God has for me. My friends, that's grace. Outrageous, scandalous, unfair, unexpected, and for Paul, profoundly unearned. Now, I would think about this throughout the week, and I realized that, you know, that's Paul's story 2,000 years ago. That's, That's his experience. But what about you and me gathered here this morning? How do we take this fundamental truth and allow it to move the 18 inches from our head to our heart? Well, I want to share with you how that happened for me, and maybe this story will be an encouragement to you. When I was a seminary student, one of the requirements is to spend the final summer in a 12-week intensive clinical education process. It's called clinical pastoral education, CPE. And every seminary student, regardless of where you're from, has to be assigned to a particular clinical setting for 12 weeks of intense pastoral training. Some were sent to level one trauma units in hospitals in Washington, D.C. Some were sent to dementia units with folks who had no family or other close contacts. Some were sent to sit with cancer patients as they received their chemotherapy treatment. It was three months of grueling, on-the-job training. On the day when we were all about to be sent out for our first assignment, our supervisor gathered us around the table for a few last-minute instructions and a few brief words of encouragement. So we sat there, we were scared, we had no idea what to expect, and our supervisor looked at this terrified group of interns, and he said, slowly but deliberately, you are enough. And that's all he said. That's it, three words. You are enough. I remember thinking to myself, that's it? That's all you got for us? Three words, you are enough. I'm feeling sort of adequate, decent, somewhat satisfactory, right? After a few moments of awkwardness, the supervisor broke the silence and went on, and he said, you're not more than enough, because that would lead to pride. And you're not less than enough, because that would lead to despair. You are enough. And after a few more words of instruction, he sent us out to our posts. I didn't know it in the moment, but I know it now, that that was the moment where I began to fully understand grace. I can't earn it. I can't manufacture it. 
It's not based on my accomplishments. It's not based on what people think of me. It's not about competition at all. But it's also not free. Because a price was paid. My friends, in this crazy world of competition, we often struggle to find our true selves. But this morning, remember that you are recipients of grace. You are, you are the inheritors of God's outrageously unfair, wonderfully unexpected, completely unearned grace. And then hear the voice of your maker say to each one of you, you are enough. Amen. Let us stand together and renew our faith as we proclaim together the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds with the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he has worshiped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Let us offer our prayers for the church and the world. Grant, almighty God, that all who confess your name may be united in your truth, live together in your love, and reveal your glory in the world. Generous God, hear our prayer. Guide the people of this nation in the election of leaders and representatives that by faithful administration and wise laws, the rights of all may be protected and our nation enabled to fulfill your purposes. Generous God, hear our prayer. Give us all a reverence for the earth as your own creation that we may use its resources rightly in the service of others, and to your honor and glory. Generous God, hear our prayer. Bless all whose lives are closely linked with ours, and grant that we may serve Christ in them, and love one another as he loves us. Generous God, hear our prayer. Comfort and heal those who suffer in body, mind or spirit, 
Give them courage and hope in their troubles and bring them the joy of your salvation. Generous God, hear our prayer. We pray it is for those listed in our good news daily and for all those in need. Generous God, hear our prayer. We commend to your mercy all who have died, that your will for them may be fulfilled, and we pray that we may share with all your saints in your eternal kingdom. Generous God, hear our prayer. Grant us grace to offer freely what we have freely received. Empower us to use our gifts of time, talent, and treasure to the honor and glory of your holy name. Generous God, hear our prayer. Let us offer our prayers for our own needs and the needs of others. We pray this morning for the president, for all those who are sick this day, for healing and strength. We pray for our country, for wisdom and guidance as we proceed through this election cycle. And we ask, Lord, for your Holy Spirit to touch our hearts, that we might know your grace and your love, that we might shine with that grace and love in this world. Generous God, hear our prayer. Let us pray together a prayer attributed to St. Francis. Lord, make, make us, us instruments, instruments of, of your, your peace. peace. Where, Where there, there is, is hatred, hatred, let us, let so, us love. so love. Where, Where there, there is injury, pardon. Where, Where there, there is discord, discord union. Where, Where there, there is doubt, faith. faith. Where, there Where there is despair, hope. hope. Where, Where there, there is darkness, darkness light. light. Where, Where there, there is sadness, joy. joy. Grant, Grant that, that we may not, not so much seek to be, to be consoled as to console. console. To be, to be understood, understood as, as to understand, to be loved, loved as, to as to love. For it is in giving that we receive, it is in pardoning that we are pardoned, and it is, and it is in dying that we, that we are born to eternal life. Amen. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will. Almighty God, have mercy on you, forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. The peace of the Lord be always with you. Please turn and wave to your name. Can you all hear me? Good. So Eric, my battery pack is fine, so it's not a battery issue, just um, 
So if you want to bring me a handheld, I can use that from now on. Well, good morning. Uh, it's good to be together. Um, my announcements were over there, but I'll do it from memory. Um, today we are starting our fall giving campaign. This is the time each year when we begin to talk about uh, next year's planning and our goals for next year and our ongoing commitments and supports that we make uh, for that. And um, we're going to continue to uh, reflect on the question why that we started last year. Why do we do this? Why are we a part of this community? Why do we support the mission of this place? And not surprisingly, the theme that goes along with that is grace, that um, we respond to God um, because of God's gracious response to us. And freely we have received, and therefore freely we give. And so the chair of our giving uh, uh, team is Patty Hamilton, and I'd like to invite her to come forward to say a few words um, about this year's plan. Good morning. Can you hear me? Oh, baggish can now. Almost two years ago, we began the development of a giving team to help make giving and generosity part of the daily fabric of our congregational life. The ability to build on this, this idea came directly from all of you, whether you know it or not. The important ideas and the vision for our future that so many of you were instrumental in creating through our strategic planning process helped to guide our team. As a team, we asked ourselves why, and then we realized Father Doug had asked you the same just a year ago, so we gathered those whys and we began. We contemplated all of our answers, and through that, we developed a generosity statement for our church, which you will find printed on the inside cover of your bulletin. To put it more succinctly, we wordsmithed all of our whys. The statement begins with a declaration of what we believe about giving and generosity, and we believe that generosity is our response to God's unconditional love and an expression of our gratitude. Generosity requires all of us to examine what is meaningful in our lives, where we place our priorities, and how we nurture those priorities. For so many of us, that examination makes us realize that generosity and gratitude turn what we have into enough, which of course you heard Father Doug talk about this morning. We're here because we want to encourage you to continue to be a part of this journey of generosity. We want you to begin praying and thinking how now, right now, about your response to God's grace and how you can support the mission and ministry of our church. Each of us can do that. How we do it is relative to our individual circumstances, but we can all be a part of it. I think 2020 has shown us that we live in an ever-changing world and the work of our church and our part in that is more important than ever. I don't know about you, but I certainly believe and I've seen over the last seven months the truly miraculous way that we have stayed together and grown even stronger as a congregation in the face of this pandemic. It's our, our hope for you that this generosity statement serves as a reminder or perhaps a pledge from each of us to always be mindful that all we are and all we have come from God. Thank you. Thank you, Patty. Can you hear me now? Good, all right. So over the next four weeks, we're gonna continue this conversation about our um, annual giving campaign. And one of the things we are gonna do is during our courtyard connection, our fellowship time, um, after the service at, at uh, 1130, um, we are gonna focus on our various areas of ministry, worship, connect, grow, and serve. Um, of course, we can't have our annual Taste of Good Shepherd where we normally would do that in person and share food together. So we're gonna do the next best thing and celebrate those ministries um, virtually. So please join us at 11.30. We've got some great information to share with you. The link for that is on our website under the worship tab. 
Um, communion from the Reserve Sacrament does continue at 1 o'clock, so if you're joining us by live stream, you're welcome to come at 1 o'clock. Um, we have reduced the time to 30 minutes from 1 to 1.30, since more people are here in person, fewer people are coming for that. So 1 to 1.30. Um, looking at the week ahead, Pennies for Heaven is open. So if you haven't checked that out, please come later in the week and uh, visit Pennies for Heaven. Bible study, of course, continues on Wednesdays. Youth group at 7.30 on Wednesday. Rector's Roundtable continues our conversation on race um, at 7 o'clock on Wednesday. So please join us for that. And finally, two weeks from today on October 18th, uh, our diocese will be holding their annual diocesan convention, which will be a virtual convention this year. And the Eucharist is actually going to be at 10 o'clock on a Sunday morning, and you all are invited to watch that service virtually. We haven't yet decided whether we're going to be able to host that here in the church or just invite you all to, to, to do that at home, but the presiding bishop will be preaching, um, so you don't want to miss that, and uh, that will be in lieu of our normal service that day on the 18th. So be looking for more information about that and how that's going to work two weeks from today. All right, we'd like to bless and pray for those who are celebrating birthdays and wedding anniversaries. If that's you this week and you're present, could you please stand? Anybody here today? Gail, excellent. And those of you on the live stream, we are praying for you as well. So will you join me as we pray for Gail and others who are celebrating birthdays and wedding anniversaries? O oh God, our times are in your hand. Look with favor, we pray, on your servants as they begin another year. Grant that they may grow in wisdom and grace and strengthen their trust in your goodness all the days of their life. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you always. Amen. All right, finally, just a word about Holy Communion. If you've been here before, you'll know that we are still receiving in one kind only, just the bread, and um, you'll be uh, invited to come forward after the Eucharistic prayer. The bread has already been placed in um, individual uh, cups, and so I will simply be handing that to you. Please keep your mask on, and then as you uh, go back to your seat, you can lower your mask and uh, consume the consecrated bread. You will be uh, dismissed to come forward by section, starting with the orange section, then the green section, then the transepts, and I'll be moving um, to make sure that we can ensure social distancing and so forth. So please wait to be instructed by the usher. The same will be true at the end of the service. We will dismiss by section so that we're not all um, moving out the doors at the same time, and we ask that you not congregate in the narthex or uh, the courtyard, but that we um, try to move out and on as, as quickly as possible uh, per the safety protocols that we have in place. So now let us walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us, an offering and sacrifice to God.
Please stand. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. For you are the source of light and life. You made us in your image and called us to new life in Jesus Christ our Lord. Therefore we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy and gracious Father, in your infinite love, you made us for yourself. And when we had fallen into sin and become subject to evil and death, you in your mercy sent Jesus Christ, your only and eternal Son, to share our human nature, to live and die as one of us, to reconcile us to you, the God and Father of all. He stretched out his arms upon the cross and offered himself in obedience to your will, a perfect sacrifice for the whole world. On the night he was handed over to suffering and death, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread. And when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. We celebrate the memorial of our redemption, O Father, in this sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. Recalling his death, resurrection, and ascension, we offer you these gifts. Sanctify them by your Holy Spirit to be for your people the body and blood of your Son, the holy food and drink of new and unending life in him. And sanctify us also that we may faithfully receive this holy sacrament and serve you in unity, constancy, and peace. And at the last day, bring us with all your saints into the joy of your eternal kingdom. All this we ask through your Son, Jesus Christ, by him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Alleluia, Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast. Alleluia. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. Take them in remembrance that Christ died for you and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving.
those of us gathered here this morning prepare to come to receive the body of Christ, we pray for all who are joining us um, online this morning and pray that although you are not here to receive with us, that you would know the presence and power of Jesus with you in your home and in your heart.
Let us pray. Eternal God, Heavenly Father, you have graciously accepted us as living members of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and you have fed us with spiritual food in the sacrament of his body and blood. Send us now into the world in peace and grant us strength and courage to love and serve you with gladness and singleness of heart. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. And now the peace of God which passes all understanding. Keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you this day and remain with you always. Amen. Christ. Thanks be to God. <laughs>